Sometimes I just don't get it whether that's too over the top the intro <laughs> or am I just dancing to entertain myself? But anyway, when the dancing girls come in, right? You stuff. Ooh, you see me like this, you know, a little confetti <laughs> dropping down. But hey, everybody, I see people are coming into the room. What's up? Happy Friday, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is the Brooklyn Aquarium Society's Friday night live stream with our special guest, Samantha West from Zoomad Laboratories, our El Presidente, president of Brooklyn Aquarium <laughs> Society, Steve Matassa, and myself, Hello, everybody. Emmanuel, Dave, from, uh, you know me. I'm, I'm a run-of-the-mill guy. Everybody knows you. <laughs> but um, yeah, we got a lot of great stuff taking place um, this month, the next couple of months, which I'm going to jump into. Um, first and foremost, the NEC Evention. If you don't, you don't know about the uh, Northeast Council of Aquarium Societies, Evention is coming up the 25th of this month it's going to be a weekend long event march 25th through the 27th is going to be great you may just see a surprise guest show up at that period which i will leave to be announced at another time but we're going to have special promotions we're going to have a weekend of great speakers we're going to have an international speaker night on saturday night we're going to have raffles it's going to be a lot of fun so check out the northeast aquarium society Evention. I'm going to throw up the website here. So if you guys don't know, you can get more information on it. Registration is free. We're going to have a great raffle. Um, for every raffle you partake in, every $5 in raffle that you partake in, you will get another ticket. Every $5 gets you another raffle ticket. So that's going to be cool. We got a photo contest, awesome stuff. Check out the website for more information. It's coming up very soon. Um, and back to my first love, the Brooklyn Aquarium Society, because, you know, it starts at home and I'm a Brooklyn boy. We're going to have our in-person meeting. Thank the maker. We're going to have an in-person <laughs> meeting. It's been a while, Finally. people. It's been a while. We've jumped through hoops. We got through the old, you know, I'm not going to speak of that, which has many names. But we are having an in-person meeting on April 8th next month april 8th the second friday of the month it's not going to be at education hall because we had to jump through quite a few hoops to, to secure a location it's going to be at saint brendan's catholic church which is located at 1202 avenue o in brooklyn i'm going to have of course posted everywhere including right here the information so you can find it i'm going to have the information on our brooklyn aquarium society website basny.org um, you know how we do it. We're going to have a speaker from Brooklyn, from one of the first aquatic farms in New York City. So I'm psyched. <laughs> I'm really, really amped up. Aquaponics, she calls it, right? Yeah. Aquaponics. aquaponics. And what I've she seen. all kinds of fruits and things and vegetables. If and I know, like yeah. On the top of a pond. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Hey, wait a minute. If my wife knew I could be growing vegetables with all this stuff. <laughs> oh. Ooh, boy, I I'm might gonna, be. I'm going to tell her. <laughs> I could have been over. <laughs> but, but that is going to be awesome. Yemi from Aqua Farms. That's A K O. Aqua Farms in Brooklyn is going to be speaking. It's just getting back to the live, in person, the interaction. I know you guys have been asking me for months. When are we going to do it? When are we going to do it? It's been difficult. It's been, over two years been, now. It's been two years. We're going to do it. And not only are we going to do it, we're going to do it like the old days. We're going to have. I'm going to escape a few tanks, Steve. I know we got tanks that we're going to bring in. We're going to have some done up tanks for all. So bring, bring your money. <laughs> bring your money, baby. Bring the money. We're going to have some live fish. I got quite a few breeders that have been breeding that have not been able to sell or trade their fish because we have not been meeting. We're going to have some fish up for auction. It's going to be great. So look out and we want to see you next month. If you got any questions, leave them in the comments below. I see you guys have been questioning me already, but you know, I'm like a one armed paper hammer. We got our buddy here, Bill Amelli. What's happening, Bill? Good evening. We got a few people messaging and falling into the room. Thank you, everybody, once again for joining us. Um, I don't want to hog all the spotlight. That's enough no. about me. David, uh, there's another thing, too. I know you gave the address. It's on uh -huh. the corner of Avenue O and East 12th Street, so off of Coney Island Avenue in Brooklyn. They have a big parking lot to park right across the street, too. It's in, it's only it's go down three steps to the basement, and you're right there, four steps. It's, it's easy to get in. 
Even the old people can make it. <laughs> wow. I was going to say something, but I think I we classify as the old people. <laughs> wow. I'm one but of the any, old people. I'm one of the yeah, old people. <laughs> thank goodness. <laughs> thank goodness. But anyway, we want to see you guys there. We can't wait to see you. We want to get back into the swing of things. Um, and we're, and everybody has Google Maps, for Christ's sakes. 1202 Avenue O. Put it in Google Maps. It walks you right up to the front door. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not in the, it's not, it's in Parish Hall. So, I got to say one thing. We're opening the doors. It's, nobody will be allowed in before 730. We have to set everything up, especially what's going on. 7.30, we'll open the doors. Please, people, wear a mask. Bring a mask. We're not, you know, enforcing the vaccination maybe and everything else, but just for your own safety, not just for everybody else's, you know, just to, uh, just to keep things safe. You and know, I'll we keep bring our distance, few. try to be, you know, respectful of everybody's space there, and yeah. hopefully we can, we can do this again. We can continue with this. Yeah, because it's been a long time. We can't be, you know, we're fish folk. We yeah. got to talk to each other. We get nuts. We start talking to the fish, and they don't answer. Yeah, it's not the ones I got. You're, you mean your, fish, your, fish, your fish don't talk? No, they keep turning upside down when I talk I to think, them. They uh, just go uh, to the top. I uh, think it's me. But um, all right. without going too far into the evening, Samantha West from Zoomed Laboratories, we've been chewing the fat about how great it must be to actually do what we love and, and get paid for it. I'm like <laughs> ready to move across country. So, sweet. Um, if you could tell I, us a little bit about yourself. Just to, just to tell, tell everybody, too, they, she comes from ZooMed, a company that has supported us for years. Yes. And if it wasn't for companies like ZooMed, we wouldn't be in existence, our club. So yes, we really, shout out to ZooMed Like Zoom I said, Lab a big before. shout out for them and, and a big thanks to ZooMed. And Rita, Rita has always been very generous to us. And like I said, we appreciate it, you know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for having us. And we, we are honored to be sponsors, honestly. It's, a, it's an honor to... Uh, be able to promote um, societies of like-minded folks who are just stoked on fish. Um, that's pretty much all of us back here. It's This is definitely one of the funnest jobs I've ever had. Uh, ZooMed likes to hire hobbyists, so people who just like bring that natural like stokage, that energy and that that uh, love of the hobby to work. Um, so it's been very fun. I get to like hang out with really cool animals all day um, and and animal care is a huge part of my job here and ensuring that they have everything they need um so it's it's really it's a it's a true joy i feel really really lucky that i'm like so excited to get up every day and come work here so it's really cool um yeah like i said my name is uh samantha west thank you for the introduction y'all can call me sam um, I'm from Buffalo, New York myself, actually. So okay. I slowly, right. <laughs> uh, and my brother lives in Manhattan right now. Uh, my, okay. my dad is a born and bred New Yorker. Um, so uh, um, very excited to be here. Um, uh, my co-author Andrew and I are animal care specialists here um, with a particular focus on fish. So aquatics are uh, like our passion. And I'm also pursuing a master's degree right now in the process of getting specifically studying um, the mating behavior of live bearing fish is my research topic for that. Um, so I've been really looking forward to this talk for a while. You're going to talk about enrichment uh, and summarizing some of the science behind uh, how you can get your fish the most enriched uh, mental life possible. So yeah. my fish may enrich in my life. I think they got some things to teach me. I mean, Sometimes Thanks, my really. nerves are rattled and just the way you have that tank behind you, like, tell us a little bit about that tank. I can't ignore that. Yeah, this is a beautiful <laughs> tank that we have. Um, this is one of one of our planted tanks. You can see, let's see if I can get you all a little bit closer. So these are spotted cichlids uh, that we have in here. And it was so cool when we were setting up for this talk. We literally, I was literally just saying how I would love to try to put some effort into getting these guys spawning and then and they were like bam with them like do it like right there it was like so that was crazy. perfect timing it was amazing i haven't actually seen like gotten eyes on that behavior yet so we have seen we've seen like a single like baby in this tank uh and then just didn't get eyes on it again it's such a big tank that it's almost impossible to like pull babies out separately um so we'll see but yeah these guys are are so much fun. They're very personable. They'll like swim right up to you when you walk up to the tank and um, a very, very cool species. They like the young ones start out with spots on them. Like you might be able to see one of the spotted one. There's a lot of glare on the glass, but, and then they lose that spotting and which uh, they just become like having a, 
Um, it's just a, a stripe on the one side, a bar on the one side as they age. So you can assess like how old they are. So what size tank is that? Oh gosh. I don't That's even know off the bag. top of my head. One, the stand is beautiful. 250. Yeah, this is um it's big. Yeah. one of our phase. It's it's quite an effort to clean, but uh we, we get to it. I'm so. I'm sure you cleaned it up for the meeting, but right? <laughs> <laughs> it's always this clean. It always looks like that. <laughs> I know I do that when everybody comes over. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it actually is not to like toot our own horn, but um they mm -hmm. the one of the one of the draws that brought me to this job is the level of animal care. It's, um, I, I was honestly nervous interviewing, like if the care is not good, I'm going to walk away. But these animals get so much care, so much interaction, like anything they need, like eyes on them all day and anything even remotely wrong, like, you know, no expense spared. So um, it was really like made me realize that, you know, behind this company is people who just like really love and care about these animals. And so it's, it's such a, such a cool team to get to be a part of. It's really fun. So yeah, and yes, thank you. Um, yes, I believe they are African cichlids. Um, spotted is the common name. Uh, Trophius duvazi yeah. is the uh, the scientific name. So white. We have a few people so that nice. kept Trophius here, and I've never oh, seen them spawn like we just saw. Just that just was so a few amazing. Ago. I wish we had that recorded. That oh was man. Really Incredible. We've been we've been wanting to get eyes on that behavior with these guys for ages. So. It's a very cool sight. Very get, get to see that. <laughs> I'll have to send you all an update. See if we get any babies out of these guys. Mm -hmm. okay. You can raise fish for years and never have the that, that exact moment that you look at the tank when something like that happens when mm. they spawn. It's very and they cool. were right in the front. They were right in the front. <laughs> I was like, like wait right a minute. in front of us. Like, was... right there. And I was like, oh yeah, I can see it. My jaw was dropping. It was great. So yeah, yep. so cool. Oh, so I can still remember as a kid watching guppies have babies. That was the first thing I've ever seen. And the babies coming out and just like springing open like and stuff, you know, and start to swim. And I'm like, yes. wow, this is so cool, you know? Yes, I I've had, had eyes on, on, on a live birth once also. And it's like, it was, I, I walked, this was my research lab. I walked in and I had only intended to come in for a quick feeding and ended up staying for like three hours so I could watch her give birth. But it was really, uh, really amazing. So now let's get the presentation up yeah so i'll Are go you, ahead you're and, plugged uh, in it's powered in i believe so yes <laughs> it uh, is um all right so i will start sharing my screen here and wait we have to give credit to your special helper and the chair yes give them a shout out <laughs> shout them out real quick my co-author andrew elston um is uh has contributed really heavily to this talk and he knows a lot more about certain aspects of this talk than I do. So he will also be available for questions if anyone has particular particular. Oh, shout out to Andrew. Shout out to Andrew. Thank you. The Andrew. man in the chair. The best. <laughs> like Spider-Man, yeah. the man in the chair. All right, I got it here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, okay, so I'm going. Um, so I'm working off a single screen it. here so I can no longer see any of you. Um, so just give, uh, give me a shout out if there's particular questions or anything. Um, y'all can, can see everything. Okay. Yes, we can. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Well, like I said, thank you all for having me here. Um, here's the name of this talk. Our I pleasure. This photo of this goldfish here. Um, yeah. So, so the goal of this talk is pretty much just to share some pretty straightforward ways that you can provide some enrichment for your aquarium fish to talk about just like what enrichment is overall, whether or not fish need it. Spoiler alert. Yes, they do. And, uh, then to uh, summarize some of the scientific research behind like fish intelligence and cognition and uh, um, some of the particular applications. So we'll start out with some cool science, go into some ways you can like provide some enrichment and then end with some equally cool science if I can uh, convince you to stick around for the whole thing. Um, so I will just jump in here. What is enrichment? And do fish even need it? Well, yes, they do. Um, and so these are some of my favorite like little fish faces here. I think folks tend to underestimate the intelligence of fish because they have such kind of like goofy faces, um, but they're actually capable of some really amazing higher cognitive uh, capacity thinking. Um, and so I'll walk y'all through some of that um, in a couple slides down. But enrichment has a ton of definitions uh, depending on what source you talk to. 
So enrichment generally just allows animals to demonstrate species typical behaviors, behaviors that that species would, would do in the wild. It gives them opportunities to make choices or to like have a say in their habitat and their environment. It provides them with challenges that are appropriate for that species that can uh, stimulate them cognitively and mentally and just generally enhances their well-being overall. And uh, it kind of an unspoken understanding to this definition is that there's uh, an aspect of novelty with enrichment. So any item or anything you're doing with your fish or with any pet that you do very often will eventually become a routine. So with enrichment, you always kind of want to keep in mind that you always want to be ramping it up a little bit, or you always want to be introducing new things um, to keep things fresh and exciting for fish. So enrichment really can be summarized as just anything that uh, not disrupts their day, but provides something new in their day and in their lives um, to keep their lives mentally stimulating. And there's actually a ton of scientific information on fish intelligence and fish cognitive abilities. Here are some screen caps of some scientific studies. There are lots of popular science articles on this topic and there are entire books on this topic. And so to summarize it all, fish are really capable of uh, some really intelligent, complex thought. And so if you're not convinced about this or if their goofy little faces just have you doubt in what I'm saying, I will try to convince you with some really cool videos of some fish behavior. Uh, for example, videos of fish using tools. So fish do use tools. And this video I'm really excited to share because it's actually the original video documenting tool use in fish. Believe it or not, this video came out in 2011. Um, and so it's the first instance, at least in the in the animal behavior, scientific academic world, the first documented instance of fish using tools. Um, and so this is an orange spotted tusk fish, I believe. Yes, it is. This wow. video was filmed in 2011 uh, by a Dr. Giacomo Bernardi, who is a professor at UC Santa Cruz, filming uh, this tusk fish using a rock to break open a clam. So I'm just, it's only two minutes. And so I'm just gonna play it for y'all. Wow, so my fish could have been helping around the house, basically. <laughs> They've been goofing off these fish. They haven't washed a single dish in there. It's ridiculous. They sure haven't. <laughs> I wish I could just clean the tank. I'd be happy with that. <laughs> Imagine that. Right? Well, that Keep the glass down once in a while. Keep their own house out. clean. <laughs> That's a beautiful fish. I know. Oh, this is this must have been. I can't imagine what he was feeling while he was filming this. Must have been so cool. Wow. And he's That's carrying that rock quite far. Yeah, <laughs> he really far. is. And so he's going over this first rock, kind of trying it, but like, eh, I don't know. Like, how eh, yeah, this one's a little it's sharp. Not the best rock, maybe. Wow, yeah, I've never seen that that species. There's so many species that we still have yet to right. even see. Well, we, we oh, really we got another one. In the the ocean. Ocean. Exactly. Yeah. There's, there's thousands of species, yeah, that we don't know, we never see. And now while even while we're looking at that, while you talk while we talk about, you know, the topic of enriching their environment, we have this painted picture of what a reef is. And mm -hmm. it's so far from what we're looking at right now. Mm -hmm. Like people get overwhelmed with what they think it should look like. Mm -hmm. It can be a beautiful tank just with simple structures like like, like we're looking at. Mm -hmm. It's very true. Yeah. So you can oh, see wow, your, your tank should be your tank should be what you look you like. That's all. Yeah. Wow. Look at him with this rock. You appreciate. So here you go. He's like throwing oh. that clam right against that rock there. <laughs> I dropped it. He likes clams. Oh, wow. Not to mention, I got to give him a, a, a heads up. He's got a pretty nice house right there. He does. Yeah. That's a He's pretty got a nice roof spot. over his head, you know. Great location. I see that little fish on top looks like a, a chalk basslet. Yeah, chalk yeah. Pass, a little stripe on there with your pet teeth passing them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah, so that video, um, so cool that that's like the original video. You can find that right on YouTube. And then since that was published, um, scientists have documented similar behaviors in so many other species of fish. Uh, green wrasses, also known as black spot, black spot tusk fish, yellowhead wrasses, six bar wrasses. Um, so, so very cool. 
And even further than that, further than just using tools, fish can actually innovate to use tools in new ways. So this video I'm gonna show you was actually published um, alongside a scientific paper as like a supplemental video. And it was these researchers who were originally doing a feeding study and they had a feeding machine that you'll see in this video. It lights up with a light and uh, it was designed just for fish to pull a string with their mouths and that string would release some food right into the tank and then they could swim over and eat it. Um, and it was designed to test like which foods they liked most, which foods they pulled the string most for. Um, but what happened was that these fish also, each fish had a dorsal fin tag with like an ID number on it. And these fish realized that they could pull the string with the tag and that the food would come out and then they could eat it faster than if they had to pull the string with their mouth and then also eat with their mouth. Wow. Um, and so then the fish started doing this on purpose to get the food that much quicker than when they use their mouth to pull the string. So here's a really quick little video of that happening. Not nearly as beautiful of a landscape, um, but you'll see what I mean. So here they are pulling that string with their mouth. These are uh, Atlantic cod, by the way. So that's when they accidentally yanked it with that tag. And then this is when they realized that they could do it on purpose. <laughs> wow. Little troublemakers in there. Wow, my so, fish are lazy. <laughs> not doing my anything. fish need jobs. You guys need jobs. <laughs> These fish have they're these fish are scientists, they're doing research. Um, so this is all just to demonstrate that fish are really capable of some really complex thought um, and some upper level cognitive functioning. And so as aquarists, it's our responsibility to provide them with an environment that's not only physically adequate for them, but also mentally stimulating, just like with any pet you'd have. Um, so what are ways that folks can approach enrichment? Well, what I'm gonna emphasize on pretty much every slide is that this is the way to approach enrichment is gonna be different for every species of fish. So something that could be really perfect and enriching for one species is not gonna be good for another species. And even within in a species, fish are individuals. And so what one fish might like, another fish might not like at all. I'm sure everyone here is familiar with like differences in their individual fish. Um, so that will always be the theme of this talk, but there are some really straightforward ways that you can approach enrichment with equipment that you already have in your house. So I will be highlighting some of our products that we make that are good for this, um, but there are also things that you can do with stuff you already have right in your tank at home to add a bit of enrichment into your fish's life. So this includes attending to their social environment, who they're in the tank with, or if they should even have tank mates, the physical structure, so what you have in your tank, the water, the movement of your water is something that you can pay attention to and change up for enrichment. And then in particular, I'm gonna get in depth with feeding, diversifying what and how you're feeding your fish. And then lighting. Lighting isn't something I think that most people think of as something that can be really enriching, but it actually can be. Um, and there's a lot of really cool research that's uh, kind of a new area of research on uh, fish and light in particular that I'm gonna get into at the end. So, so to address the first couple, social environment, um, pretty straightforward, but if you have a shoaling species of fish, you should make sure that they have other fish in the tank with them so that they can have lots of social interaction, highly social fish species. A huge part of their day is interacting socially um, and establishing that social structure, obtaining mates, making babies, all that good stuff. Um, so you want to really make sure that you attend to that. If you have a mixed species group, make sure that they're species that will work well together. Don't just like toss a bunch of random species in a tank. Um, make sure that it's a species that have similar water quality parameters and that will also socially be okay that you won't end up with individuals bullying other fish in the tank or whatnot. Um, this is probably very familiar information to many experienced aquarists out there, but if you're new to the hobby um, or just someone who's interested in it, uh, these are things to pay attention to. And then if you have a solitary fish species, so puffer fish are example, not always have to be solitary. They do sometimes get along well with other individuals, but oftentimes depending on the individual, <coughs> betta fish are another example of this. Um, you know, having other fish in that tank can be stressful for them depending on the species and the individual. So making sure you have a good social environment is like the first step um, to, uh, reducing stress and then also uh, adding in those social interactions that all these fish will love. 
the next is your the physical structure of your tank. So this is a photo of one of our tanks, got one of our shy guy cichlids in the back there. Um, and so the goal with your tank structure is really to design and maintain a physical environment that'll give your fish what they need using the stuff that's already in there. So structures, plants, live or fake, rocks, logs, whatever, even the substrate are all things that your fish can interact with. And so again, you're gonna wanna pay attention to the species that you have and like the needs of your individual fish. So if you have a species with territorial individuals, you might wanna create structures for them to defend, um, structures, places for them to claim as their own territory. Um, and so those fish, you will wanna pay attention. They might not like it if you're going in there and moving stuff around. Um, I have a really dramatic puffer fish on my desk at work here who absolutely hates it. Even cleaning his tank, he like, throws a hissy fit. Um, Mine so used to move stuff all the time. If I moved it, I would watch him actually push it back. <laughs> it drive me nuts. Oh yeah. No, he will. Uh, he's uh, he's quite finicky. He'll hot, he'll like hide in the back corner of his tank all day after I do even a, even the most basic of cleanings. It's, it's ridiculous, honestly, but. Um, and, and somebody that asked, I believe that is a waru. That is one of the fish. Uh, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah, for, South uh, the king of DIY is known for the waru cichlids. Very yeah. hard to find now in the sales uh, <laughs> of fish now. They are very cool. They're very, um, yeah, They these fish in particular are a great example of this because they really appreciate having places where they can kind of hide. They don't always like to be out and about. Um, and so paying attention um, to what's in their, in their tank um, randomly introducing stuff, even just like dropping something new in a tank. Again, for some fish, they might be picky. They might not want it in there, but for some fish, they might love it and it might give them something new to come investigate and check out and can be really mentally stimulating for them. So always a good thing to attend to. And even the substrate I'm going to mention, I used to have a, a Cuban cichlid and she loved to like pull pieces of gravel under her mouth. I'm sure most folks with mouth brooding cichlids in particular have witnessed this playing with the gravel, holding it in their mouth, kind of, she'd like swim up to the tank and like spit it out at me. It was really cute. <laughs> um, and so uh, um, even the substrate can be something that your fish will interact with. So pay attention to that. Um, a plug for some of our products, we make some wood pieces, our spider wood and our Mopani wood in particular also releases tannins. So like with these URA species, they sometimes really like uh, tannic acidic water. And so if you're, if you have a black water tank and you want to, um, get some tannins in there. This wood can be great. You can just drop it in and have a beautiful piece in your tank there and then also have that water quality you're looking for. It's so funny. I literally just looked at that piece on the top <laughs> in the store like today and I was like, I wonder if there's tannins in that wood. There That's are tannins. The heavy one. That one is pretty dense. There is they come in a variety of sizes. Um so you can get smaller ones. But yeah, they're they're it's pretty nice. heavy. Mm -hmm. I see that piece of uh, the wood they showed a picture of my palm, whatever it's called. And mm -hmm. what I like about that is it heavy, they sink right down. You don't have to worry exactly. about like, that. Exactly. That's what I was like. Yeah. Some yep. driftwood you could sew for weeks and they still float. This thing here goes right down. It doesn't fall apart over time and stuff. Because I've had it in my tank for quite a long time and take them out, wash them off. They still look like they're new. Yeah, they they're great. Well. They are. And they will sometimes grow moss on them, which is really, I, I love the look of moss. I think it looks really beautiful. It gives other fish in the tank something to kind of pick at um and is just uh i think it looks really gorgeous so uh, yeah uh great pieces for that for establishing that structure in your tank um and then water movement in your tank lots of folks kind of have a filter in there you might take it out and move it every once in a while to clean it but you can actually really easily add some movement <coughs> into your tank just by moving the placement of your filter and creating like a new current in your tank um so i'm going to highlight some more of our products, um, but if you have like an external canister filter, like one's pictured here, they usually have like their optake tube that just goes and like sticks on a wall with some suction cups or something. You can literally just move that to another side of your tank, create a whole different water flow in there and just kind of change up your fish's day a little bit can be a really quick and easy way to get some enrichment in there. Or if you have a submersible filter like our Paladarium series, they have this like outtake bar here that you can rotate and twist and all these things to really change up. They can also help with like the aeration of your water by like getting some surface agitation there. Super easy. You can also get just pumps that aren't filters. And these are great because since it's not like your main filter, it doesn't need to be on all the time. 
Um, and so you can put them on a timer so that they can come on and off at random times. We actually just enacted this technique with some of our touchers who we noticed were like not interacting with their tank environment all that much, get some uh, water movement in there to really just keep, keep it interesting, keep it flowing. And then we even make a filter attachment called an aqua sweep that just changes like the shape of the outflow of your filter. And that can also be a great way to just like alter the currents in there. Um, so even just changing up the movement of the water in your tank can give your fish almost like a whole new world in there. Just be aware that for some fish, fast moving water might be a little stressful. That is for example. So always just keep in mind the needs of your species and your individual fish. And for any kind of enrichment, anytime you're enacting something new in a tank, go one at a time, like change one thing, see how your fish are doing, change another thing, and then pay attention to water quality. Um, like I mentioned previously, some fish do really great in tannic acidic water. Um, and so you can uh, also alter the water quality to help reduce stress or add enrichment. So those are some really like straightforward, easy things you can do. Um, so dietary enrichment is another way. Um, probably every single aquarus learns like right away that feeding time is every fish's absolute favorite time of day. <laughs> Those fish are uh, can be beggars for sure. Um, and so I'm gonna get a little bit more in depth with this because there's a ton of different ways that you, you can use your fish's diet to provide enrichment. Uh, important. Um, yes, so feel free to jump in with questions at any time. Can't just uh, feed the fish the same flake for like two years straight. <laughs> well, you can technically, but it might get boring for them. <laughs> um, and so I'm actually going to start off talking about flake foods because the first step to dietary enrichment is always to make sure you're providing high quality foods to maintain your fish's health. Because if your fish are not healthy, they won't have the energy to fully engage with any other enrichment thing you're doing in your tank. So I'm going to put a plug in for our recently reformulated spirulina. Oh, yeah, um, about like a year ago or so, we changed our formula to remove all the yeast fillers. Um, and so it allowed us to pack a lot more spirulina and fish meal content in there. Um, and so spirulina is, I think, also just a really great like base flake food. A lot of aquarists rely heavily on flake foods as their main food. And so if that's what you're going to do, spirulina is great because it has tons of health benefits. It's a blue-green cyanobacterium. It has a ton of protein in it and just a ton of really important vitamins and minerals for your fish's health. Um, it can be a source of carotenoids, which is really great for coloration, uh, like that orange coloration that you see in a lot of guppy species, for example, is carotenoid-driven. And then that coloration is really important for mate choice and breeding in those fish. So there's just a whole chain reaction there. So spirulina can be a great source of that. It's an immunostimulant, so it can help prevent disease, which will keep the stress levels in your tank low. Lord knows everyone's sick to death of, of battling ick in their tanks. And then uh, there are several scientific studies that have shown actually that spirulina as a food source can increase both growth rates and survival rates in fish. So it's an all around great base flake food. Um, and I'm really not just saying that because I work for ZooMed, but I've noticed yeah. that our fish here really love these flakes. Like some of our shy boys who don't really, they prefer us to leave the room when they eat, will come right out uh, for these flakes. They really like it you know, more so than almost anything else we'll give them. So um, it's a great food. And now somebody asked whether you can feed this to saltwater fish. My saltwater fish yes. love spirulina. I'm not just saying that because ZooMed <laughs> is there, but I tried it. And I'm so happy that you mentioned that is less uh, yeast fillers because that mm -hmm. was the topic of a talk a long time ago, like what the ratio of actual spirulina to fillers is. Mm -hmm. And I actually, when bringing tangs home or moving them or trying to like clean a tank, I usually put the spirulina in there or I'll use like the garlic mixed with the spirulina to mm -hmm. kind of boost their immune system. And they love that. And it's so much easier than using those algae clips. It is, yeah. It's it's um it's really great for that. It's uh and yeah, can be used for fresh or salt water. And yeah, it just has so many health benefits associated with it. Um, it's like a great base. I honestly did not use it all that often before I started this job. And then when I was learning about this formula, and then it, it was really just witnessing the reaction of the fish to the flakes. I was like, oh whoa, they love this stuff. So yep. um it's great for that. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, I usually try to do is I, I'm sorry, 
I try oh, to no. put it like in the flow, so this way it goes around the time. Because a lot of times you'll have some of the bigger fish will take everything, and the other fish don't get a chance to, uh, to mm -hmm. eat as much. You take a little bit in your hand, you put it like right where the water flow is and stuff, and it shoots around the tank, and mm -hmm. you go crazy for it. It does, and that is a perfect segue into the next point about enrichment, which is oh, actually no, sorry, I skipped I skipped a slide. Um, but what I will mention will be feeding in different ways, and even literally just like dropping it into different parts of the tank. So like dropping it right by the filter outtake or like in a different corner from usual can kind of make your fish feel like, you know, less like they're just coming forward and eating for two minutes mm -hmm. and then going back, like they're kind of have to hunt that food down a little bit. Um, so great for that, a great tip there. Um, other things you can feed your fish are just, you can just vary the different items you're offering. So lots of times folks don't think of like treats as being something you can give your fish. People tend to think of treats as like, that's for dogs and cats, but it's not true. Uh, we make fish treats. <laughs> and in particular, uh, we make a line, we call them our and they're just like inverts right in a can. Uh, depending on the size and the needs of your fish, you can like rotate through or use specific ones of these. Um, and so they're great for that. If you're offering them like semi-periodically, um, not so often that your fish come to expect them, but with enough variation and space between that it's kind of like a special treat, it can really just um, give them a, something new and interesting to munch on. Um, these are also really fatty and nutrient filled foods, which can be great if you're trying to fatten any up for breeding, very physiologically stressful time for fish. Um, and so these are also a great supplement to your diet. Just to order that can of Cyclops, because yeah. for a while that was very hard to find. And I didn't know that Zoomed actually had, I, I'm assuming that's the powder form. The Cyclops? Yeah, because that you can it's also feed your coral. Oh, okay. See, I'm very inexperienced with, with coral keeping. Um, so I didn't actually know that. That's very cool. This is not powdered. It's it's like in liquid. Oh, so that's uh, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that's it's perfect. great. It's great. Yes, yeah, so the Cyclops is great for all our really little guys. So I feed them to my like desk guppies and just anyone teeny enough that they'll um, like it. Um, and some of our baby newts that we have also like the Cyclops a lot. Well, the fish, when I breed the fish, I kind of wean them off of baby brine shrimp because there's mm -hmm. really not a lot of nutrients in brine shrimp. Mm -hmm. And I switched over to Cyclops and they love it. They put so much growth on and the colors are amazing. So, yeah, oh, I, didn't know, I didn't know you guys actually, I got to look into that, put that on my grocery list. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be ordering that very soon. Glad to hear it. Yeah, we, uh, a lot of our guys really, really like it here. I just walk around with a little spoon. It's kind of like baby food. You're just like, yeah, exactly. To everyone. So, um, yeah, uh, so very rotating through those are, are great options. Uh, we also make these are called banquet blocks. So, in addition to being just like something else you can give your fish, these are blocks that sink. Um, and actually, pretty much most of our, our canos also sink. And so if you're looking to give them a little diversity in terms of where they're eating, so that they are not just always eating at the surface, um, these blocks will sink. They can pick off them at the bottom of the tank. And they usually last a couple days. So if you're like, oh, my gosh, I need to leave for the weekend. I forgot to find someone to feed the fish. Just drop a block in there and they'll be okay. Have something to so they, off. They, dissolve, wow. they dissolve slow. They don't just uh, break yes. up like right away. Yeah. And, yeah. and a lot of times yeah. the fish kind of pick them apart before they have like a chance to dissolve. Um, the plecos in particular, I notice really like the pleco blocks. Um, yeah. they'll, like, we'll drop them in and then we'll just like flock to yeah. it. Um, and then you get that nice pretty white poop afterwards. So, <laughs> um, Better than brown poop. <laughs> <laughs> and, ju and just so everybody knows, if you come to the meeting next month, They've just donated some of this stuff to us, Zoom. We will have them on the tables. Cool. Yeah, shout out to Zoom. Show up. <laughs> hey, oh, we are we are honored to be a sponsor. Always happy to encourage fish excitement. Um, so yeah, we also make some of these red shrimp that are sun dried. So these float. So if you have um, fish that prefer eating at the surface um, and you want to get them up there for eating stuff, shrimp is or uh, these are great for that. They're so crispy. I like have to resist like eating them myself. They like seem like actual people snacks. Um, <laughs> again, for uh, any wood eating species, uh, any of our like actual wood pieces are great for those guys. Give them something to munch on. Uh, and like I mentioned previously, they also will grow moss, which is really great. And then other guys in your tank might be able to pick at that. Um, and they just look really beautiful. So just a couple of the different items rotating through food items and offering different foods can 
do wonders in terms of just giving your fish something new and exciting in their in their diet and in their day. Yeah. I've actually put j uh, java fern around that uh, the, the driftwood. Yeah. And it just covers it and stuff. Java fern, java moss, and it looks really cool when it's finished up. Yeah, like that, you know? I love java moss, and it's so great. And I like I'm obsessed with live bearers, and I've always had them, so I always like to have oh, java moss oh, in there just in case a female yeah, has yeah. babies. They can it's go an easy, right. an easy plant spreads quick. Mm -hmm. Grows really easily, yeah, like super easy yeah. to, to move around. It's I'm a fan. Yeah, that's the best of both worlds because the plecos need that wood to graze <laughs> on too, and you know it's a nice mm -hmm. and decorative piece. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for that. It's like yes, it has 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 all the benefits. It's great. Um, yeah, and then other things mentioned are feeding in different ways. Uh, just feeding at different times of day and literally just putting food in different parts of the tank are all good ways. Um, and so we also make what's known as a floating fish food clip. Um, and so these are, they'll like hold just like a piece of lettuce or a veggie or anything under the water. Um, here's a picture of um, some of our cichlids going ham, nibbling at some of those leaves. Um, and so um, it's great for if you again have a, a species who's kind of shy from eating at the surface of the water, this will hold the like lettuce or whatever you put on it uh, further down in the water column so that they're a little more comfortable coming to eating it. And we've personally observed actually with the um, spotted cichlids that were behind me, they won't even touch lettuce unless it's on a clip, uh, in which case then they'll absolutely go nuts for it and kind of rip it to shreds. Um, so just another way that you can kind of feed like in a different way. And then also getting some like interactive or some automatic feeders in there. Um, so we have a couple automatics here the betamatic and the turtle matic that can be easily adapted for really any fish, just put a different kind of food in there. And those are cool because you can change the timing on them to feed at different times of day. So your fish aren't coming to expect getting fed at one time every single day. These little dilatrete things here for bettas are really cute because they rotate through different types of snacks. So your fish is never quite sure what they're gonna be getting next, keeps things interesting for them. And then these floating feeders are really cool. Um, they can be easily used for like other larger fish um, and it gives them kind of like a cognitive puzzle to figure out how to get the food as well as just being like a novel object in a tank can be really enriching something for them to literally play with and explore. And you can even combine these with live food. So any kind of wormy or anything that'll wriggle out of there can be fun and interesting and then give them that added extra benefit of like seeing the wiggles really live can be really stimulating for them. So these are all cool things that you can use. Another thing, I won't spend too much time talking about this, but you can even do human fish feeding interactions. And these are really great and enriching for people also to get them to spend time with their fish. So this is a photo of our betta wand that we make and it holds a little treat at the end there. And you can like literally lead your betta or anyone, your puffer or whatever, any fish you have through their tank around obstacles um, just do a little obstacle course with them. Um, it can be great like bonding session for you and your fish. Um, this photo for, that I had on the title slide always cracks me up because it's just like, yeah, fish can play sports too. Um, and so you can use treats as rewards and uh, teach your fish to do a number of really cool behaviors. You can get them jumping out of the water. I won't spend too much time on that, but there are tons of videos and tutorials online if you want to train your fish using treats as rewards for that. You can do lots of cool stuff. Um, and again, these, this is just an example of a feeder that you can make. It's just a tube with some little live worms in there that wriggle out. It can just be a way for you to like get some one-on-one -on -one interaction with your fish, which can also be really enriching for them because these fish are used to seeing us walking around, being a part of their environment. And so interacting with us as a provider of food and as like a safe individual can be really great and really good for your bond. And then the last thing I will touch on is live foods. And I'm going to give a shout out to my co-author, Andrew, here because he knows a lot more about this um, than I do. But live foods are really awesome and can allow your fish to actually like hunt their food and eat it alive rather than just eating a flake or a pellet or whatever you're giving them. There are so many different things you can feed. Daphnia, brine shrimp, as you were mentioning, duckweed. And there are so many more than just these uh, vinegar eels. Vinegar eels are particularly easy to cut to cultivate and to keep. You can just keep them like in a bottle with like an apple slice for like six months and they'll be fine. Um, ostracods, copepods, paramecium, even fruit flies. And almost all of these come in like a variety of life stages or species. So you can have different sizes. 
Um, so they're really great. They do require some upfront work, but then pay off really in the long run in terms of being able to provide a really like enriching food item for your fish. Duckweed is cool. If you have any species who are kind of shy and don't like direct light, it doubles as like a surface cover for them so that they're not getting like blasted right with their light, which they may prefer. And you can get these fairly low tech little hatchery things that we've used with some success here. Um, and you can just like drop in some like freeze dried brine trimmed eggs or whatever you're trying to use, put a lid on it and they'll hatch right in there. And within 24 hours, hours you'll have a ton of whatever live food you're hatching out. Um, well, I like that. It's not the big, tall, ugly bottle that I would have on my couch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that looks nice. Yeah. It's a lot easier. It's a little more discreet um, and can be kind of used like you. It, it's a little more you can put in only as much as you are going to need the very next day or two days or whatever. Um, now, so, yeah. One of, our one, of our, one of our members, Yari, was saying that they like the idea of the floating feeder. Could it be adopted to bottom dwellers like Corydoras? But I do know that Corydoras no will problem. venture this off is, the bottom on several occasions to take food. Day. Yeah, you know, I had never even thought of using it for that, but I don't see any reason why not there. Uh, you could weigh it down with something or, or they make those like, you know, those bendy metal uh, things that you can like weigh stuff down and hold stuff on the bottom of your tank with. Um, it wouldn't like move as much, but it would still certainly give something for your fish to interact with and figure out how to get food out of there. Um, yeah, so that's a really great idea for bottom dwellers. If you could teach a fish to shoot through hoops, I think you could teach him to go to the feeder. <laughs> fish <laughs> My are so fish are playing motivated. basketball. I'm going to be a, like shock. They, I like laughed my pants off when I saw that image. I was like, oh, I got to put that in there. It's so cute. Um, but yeah, fish are so, they are such hungry, hungry hippos, hungry, hungry fishes. They will certainly teach themselves how to get food out of it, I'm sure. Um, so yeah, that is uh, the end of my section on dietary enrichment. So there are so many different ways that you can um, use your fish's diet to really introduce some just new and exciting things and your fish will definitely love it. Um, so what I'm going to end with is our last segment on lighting, which I'm really excited to talk about this because some of the research is really cool. And a lot of folks don't really often think about lighting as something that can be providing enrichment for your fish. A lot of folks, I think, just maybe get a light and put it on their tank and they're like, awesome, cool, done. Um, but that's actually not the case. Lighting can be really used uh, as an enrichment stimulus, as you will see. So you can vary your lighting daily and seasonally to provide enrichment. So changing your photo period, so um, shorter, having a shorter duration of time that your light is on during the winter versus a longer time during the summer. Um, can imitate the natural seasons, can also sometimes be a breeding cue if you have a species you're trying to get spawning um, and it's been the winter time and all of a sudden they're getting a lot more light. That can be a cue to them like, oh, it's springtime, time to make some babies. You can also periodically change the lighting intensity just to imitate the natural weather that your fish would see every day in the wild. Because in the wild, your fish are seeing cloudy days, they're seeing sunny days, rainy days, whatever. They're not seeing like, you know, or at least they're probably not seeing pure sunlight all day, every day. Um, so, and this is great because it also allows you to just like at your own discretion or whatever mood you're feeling, change up the lighting in your tank um, and in, in your home if that's where you have your tank. So. Um, a great way to provide enrichment for you and your fish. And our last product plug that I will put in here is for our Aqua FX light line. So these are our LED tank lights and they come with pre-programmed um, lighting and sound settings. They also provide sounds, which again sound. can be a cool, yeah, they have like ocean wave sounds <laughs> and like cricket sounds, which is super cool. It's like very fun and peaceful kind of white noise for your house and is also beneficial for your fish. You know, fish can, can hear and, uh, can certainly uh, might enjoy some some sounds. So some of the settings on these are like really cool. These are some of the pre-selected ones. You can also kind of customize your own. They come in different colors and then each color setting has a different intensity, one through five. So you can really vary the lighting setup in almost any way these lights. They're really fun. I have them like on every single tank that I kind of have charge of in 
in our facility. I would like, I would like that. Just like people come over and all of a sudden they hear the ocean or something, mm -hmm. and they would think it's the tank. Yeah, it's <laughs> that, it would be fun. the tank actually. Yeah, and like some of these are really cool. I'll show you some of the settings here. I come on, Steve, you got to put that. That's got to be on. Listen, the, big tank. the best, the best part about it, we have two of those next meet for the auction. That's yeah, right. they donated. That's they donated one That's of each right. of those fresh, a model one and model two. So they will be for sale next month. They are very cool. They're super fun to play with. They're remote controlled, so they're just very fun yep. to play with. And yep. and they're on. Um, you can like time them. They have a timer setting, so you can set the clock and have them come on and off when you'd like. So they're really cool, really well designed. Um, and they cute. they're very like nice. I think they look really nice over the tank. They're very sleek. Um, so very cool, and and so they make it so easy for you to just kind of change up the visual environment that your fish are experiencing. Um, and something that the Model 2 provides, which is pretty cool, is UVA light. Um, mm. So a quick overview of what UVA light even is. So here's all the light that the sun makes. The longest wavelengths are down at this end on the infrared, and the shortest wavelengths are in the ultraviolet spectrum down here. So all the light that we as humans can see is in the visible light spectrum here. And then anything shorter than that is ultraviolet. So most UVC light gets filtered out by the ozone layer, though this is quickly changing. So one of the reasons that UV light and fish is an emerging field of science is because with climate change, our ozone layers being slow, slowly depleted, allowing a lot more ultraviolet light to reach the surface of the earth and to penetrate the water. Um, and so we know in reptiles, reptiles have special cones in their eyes, special structures in their eyes, so they can see UVA light, humans cannot. Um, but reptiles can. But what about fish? Um, this is actually a, a really cool, really emerging area of research. And so our Model 2 aqua effects, which come in the nano size and the strip size, provides true UVA light. It has a peak right around 380 nanometers here. So it does provide UVA light. It's a setting on the remote. It just says UV and you click it and the UV LEDs will come on for you. And that also has a variety of intensities. Um, and so this is a question that scientists are now beginning to address. Can fish even see UV light? And it's a really burgeoning area of research. I will save you the effort of going through and reading all the scientific papers yourself by telling you that I've already done that. Um, and there's really a lot of mixed evidence from scientists as to whether or not fish can see UVA light. There are a ton of papers on this pictured here. There are entire books on this topic, but basically, if your fish are from an environment where UVA light is already available, they may benefit from exposure to it. And there's a lot of mixed studies. There are some fish that have patterns that reflect UV light, but don't seem to be able to see it. There are some fish that seem to have UV cones, UV structures in their eyes that can see UV light, but maybe don't have those patterns. Um, it may be involved in identifying predators or other individuals, not necessarily other fish. Um, so it's, it's a really cool area of research that I will summarize a bit of it for you. So what are some of the benefits of maybe providing UVA light for your fish? One of those is communication. So a really cool set of papers that came out of the lab of Dr. Ulrike Seebeck um, and many of their colleagues. Um, have studied damselfish. So it turns out that damselfish have UV reflective facial patterns that they can use to discriminate not only which fish are their same species, but also discriminate among individuals within their species and to communicate with each other in a way that their predators can't see. So, mm -hmm. so cool. So here are some photos from some of this lab's really cool work. These are just two photos of two damselfish under normal light. They look like damselfish. And here are what their faces look like under UV light. So you can see how different these two individuals look when you see them with UV light. Like this guy has all these spots. This guy has mostly like big stripes here. And so you can see how this having UV light available is like quite important for them to be able to tell individuals apart. Hmm. Here are some photos of some babies of the same species. This top guy is about 12 days old. This bottom guy is about 15 days old. And so you can see here under UV light, 15 day old guy has just started to develop a few spots here, whereas the 12 day old fish um, doesn't have any markings. Huh. Super cool research. 
Um, here are just some fun pictures from that's those couple of scientific papers summarizing this work. I just love this because I in particular study like mate choice in fish. And so these images are like near and dear to my heart. So this is just how fish scientists do research in case you're curious. This guy's in a tube that actually blocks out UV light. And then they're assessing whether or not this guy likes him more or less um, or her. Uh, and this fish here is choosing between two facial patterns. So I was wondering what that was. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, like, I thought it was like a Rembrandt or something like <laughs> a little fish living room. I mean, I think this could be modern art. I would totally frame this and hang it on my wall. <laughs> um, but these scientists created like digital images of these facial patterns. This is called a dichotomous choice experiment when you're giving fish like a choice between multiple stimuli basically to choose from. Whichever image they like associate the most with is considered to be their preference. Um, and so they're having this fish choose between these two facial images here. So just so cool. I love fish research. It's so cool. The creative ways that scientists come up with with uh, studying the behavior of these animals is really fascinating. Um, other benefits of UV light are hunting. So really cool work with zebrafish. Zebrafish are used really widely in scientific research. They're a cool model organism. And it turns out that they also have UV cones in their eyes and they can detect the movement of prey. Um, and so there were some researchers who did a study with paramecium. So these are two photos of a tank filled with paramecia. Um, and it's these two panels are a shot of the same exact image, except for this image is taken with a camera that only allows yellow light in. This image was taken with a camera that only allows UV light in. And so you can kind of see um, that in the yellow light image, you can obviously see a lot more of the background, but in the UV image, you can kind of see a lot of these little speckles a lot more, which are the paramecium. And so it's thought that having UV light allows these baby zebrafish to see their prey clearly, which can be really critical when they're, when they're in that like first couple days of growth and they really need to be eating and, uh, and growing. So these images are close-ups, our zoom-ins of these little boxes here in the corner. So the exact same scene, this is with yellow light, this is with UV light here, and these triangles are kind of pointing out these little paramecium speckles here that you can kind of see a bit more clearly with the UV light. Um, and if this is all looking very fuzzy and suspect to you, uh, there's also a video of this exact thing. So this is the exact same images I was just showing you, yellow light, UV light here. So I'll play this a couple times. So you can really see in the UV panel a lot more of the movement. You can also see it somewhat in the yellow light panel, um, but a lot more clearly and in a lot higher contrast over here um, than you can in the yellow light. So all this is to say that UVA light is probably really important for these baby zebra fish to be able to see and hunt properly. So that may even affect whether or not the parents breed or not. Mm -hmm. Go on, yes. go on to the particular lighting to see if the babies have adequate food. Yes, it food. may. Um, that's a, a a really good point. Um, that's interesting because our 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 past president, rest in peace, Joe, mm -hmm. had a habit of switching lighting. He was actually breeding some uh, some smaller Danio fish for a while, and I could not get them to breathe and i'm thinking that that may be an issue in itself the lighting i don't have the light directly over that tank i have it in a further area mm. joe, yes. joe was great at figuring out those trigger points to get things to breathe I yeah mean, he every little thing and whether water changes cold water warmer water lights and moving things around and He'd always figure them out. He was unbelievable breeding. There are <laughs> yeah. so many factors. It's such an interesting puzzle. And you're exactly right. There are so many things. Water quality, harder water, or softer water, or temperature, or yeah, the influx, the change in the temperature. We had a tank here of some different cichlids, some lipstick cichlids um, from um, the, also uh, an African species. And when all we did was move around a bunch of stuff in their tank, and, and this is all... Not, I was not even involved with this. This is all my co-author, Andrew. But he, uh, they, they sold a bunch of the fish and decreased the density in the tank. And we cannot keep up with them. They are spawning like crazy. It is like we're like running out of tanks in our facility here for them. So, so exciting for me because I'm like, yes, they're spawning. This is so cool. But <laughs> um, yeah, there are so many different things that play a factor in that, including UVA light. So this is, this is a perfect segue into my next couple points. 
Um, so zebrafish will also use UVA light as camouflage and sun protection. So they'll like selectively darken themselves in UV light. So here's a darker individual, lighter individual here. Um, and so UVA light could be really important for camouflaging and helping them feel safe in their environment um, and reducing stress, but also with breeding. So there's a lot of research with three spine sticklebacks here and they show different mate preferences. So like which individual they want to meet, they'll prefer differently depending on whether or not UV light is available and also depending on the type of water they came from. So fish from um, water bodies where UV light was available, preferred mates when they could see them under UV light. Uh, mm. Fish that came from really murky water, not so much because they murky water um, really prevents UV light from penetrating very far into the water column. Um, and so it wasn't a factor in their mate preferences. And there appeared to be a genetic component there because they found similar trends with their offspring as well. So fascinating stuff, really, really cool. Interesting. Um, yeah, and could possibly be really, beneficial if you're a breeder of any kind. Any newt breeders out there, there's also some evidence that male smooth newts, European smooth newts, were less attractive to females when they were viewed without UV light. Um, so if anyone's uh, really interested in breeding, any breeders out there providing UVA light could be a really important component to getting your fish to breed and um, just allowing them to make mating choices. We put a lot of emphasis, we put a lot more emphasis on light when it comes to reef tanks and salt water, mm -hmm. but not really thinking about the way you just put it right there, that a fish may look completely different to another fish, mm -hmm. given the light that you put over it, if they're used to looking at it in the wild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, depending on where they evolved and what light is available, where that fish came from, um, you know, if you're... If you're raising a species like a cave molly, for example, it probably doesn't matter for them because they're not from an environment where light was ever a thing. Um, but for any species um, that's existing in an area where there was light available, they probably have like the physical adaptations that have been built up over evolutionary time to see with that type of light available. So it's probably really important for their just a whole suite of their natural behaviors. So such cool stuff. Um, very exciting that this research is kind of growing. Um, so with that, I always just like to caution folks to use this responsibly. I would really like to emphasize that this research uh, is a growing field. And so if you're going to make any kind of change, this goes for any enrichment ap application, but especially UV light, introduce it slowly and monitor their health and behavior while you're doing so, um, just to make sure that they're responding all right to it. Um, and so with those aqua effects lights that I was mentioning, there's like five different intensity settings. So start it on the lowest one, ramp it up slowly, and just always make sure you're watching your fish. You know your fish better than anyone. Um, so make sure that they seem to be acting normal, still seem to be healthy and whatnot when you're making this change. Maintain regular seasons. So don't give them a ton of UVA all at once, you know, only during the daytime, keep it with their regular photo period and maybe like lessen that, lessen the intensity or remove the exposure during winter months when they wouldn't normally naturally be getting that as much. Um, make sure you're always providing shaded areas, covered areas in your tank where your fish can go to get away from the light if they want to, if it's like too much, give them the opportunity to self-regulate. And then just in general, like I was saying before, make sure UVA light is appropriate for that species. If you uh, have a fish that's like a deep water species or isn't a species that evolved in an area with a lot of light, they might not have the physical ability to deal with those shorter wavelengths of light hitting their body and it could be damaging to them. However, if you have a species that evolved in a really sunny, shallow, clear type of water, um, then UVA light might in fact be really important for them to maintain their normal biological processes. So again, like I said at the beginning, always do research into your species of fish and always keep an eye on your individual fish to make sure that any change you're doing to their environment is uh, going to be good for them. But in general, the takeaway is that providing UVA light could be really beneficial for promoting natural breeding behaviors in your fish. Um, getting them to spawn, getting them to mate, whatever you're looking to do, or hunt, or camouflage, or interact with each other just socially. So it could be a really, really good thing. Um, and that is about it, folks. So thank you so much for bearing with me this evening. Um, and I will end this talk with just some of cool photos of some of our coolest fish that we have at our facility here. 
Um, yeah, and I'll be happy to take any any further questions. Anyway. What is that fish on the left? It is a <laughs> lungfish. Oh, that is a lungfish. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's wow. an albino. Oh, right? um, yeah. shoot. I always mix up if it's Australian That's or wild. not. <laughs> pretty cool. Um, yeah, pretty cool. That's yeah, cool. he's gorgeous. He's a very sweet, sociable boy. Oh, very cute. Uh, and then these are some of our African cichlids here. And I like this photo because it, like, it looks like they're smooching, but they're actually <laughs> tussling. So <laughs> two, two males fighting for their female there. Yes. Ah, the I female guess in the cut. So, yeah, whoever wins <laughs> takes me to dinner. <laughs> Among other things, yes. Uh, yes. So, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having us. Really honored to be here and to be a sponsor of the society. So cool to have such a cool community of like I said, we can't thank you enough with your company. And like I said, you've been a great supporter of us for years. And I, I thank you for taking your Friday night and wasting your time here. Oh, of course. <laughs> Not a waste of time at all. But no, we really appreciate it. Like I said, tell Rita and everybody there that we uh, we really appreciate the way you guys always support us and always just stood behind us. And like I said, everybody that comes in next month, you'll see a lot of their stuff on the tables. So yeah, bring your money. Yeah. In your wallets, great <laughs> donations. Get your allowance from your wives or what? No, <laughs> 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 Tell them they're going out for groceries, <laughs> spending on fish. Oh, right, but kids don't have to eat. Bring the money for the food. <laughs> yeah, Lots of hungry cool. mouths. And as Steve said, there are quite a few products that were in the presentation that are going to be available at the April eighth meeting. We have not met in a couple of years. We're going to be happy to see everybody. We're going to have a lot of catching up to do <laughs> we got it catching up to do um current members free mission non-members five dollars at the door we're going to be um having we're gonna have tanks we're gonna not have the big ones but we're gonna have big ones available we we'll probably bring pictures we'll of the to, big we'll ones have some pictures not to carry them we we'll have and pictures forth, yeah. tanks with stands there's a few that are gonna be completely done we got gravel sand everything basically plug and play type things we're trying to do it up big bring you guys back into the fold keep it going you know 2022 is the year to come back hopefully we'll see right hopefully we'll be back and we can get back to normal a little bit because this is crazy uh, you can't believe you think about it it's hard to realize that it's been over two years now like this you know two years we used to have the meetings forever you know most of us have been in the club for a long time. I mean, I've probably been in about, I don't know, 15 years, maybe like that, 12 years, something like that. And just every every second Friday of the month, my wife knows, don't make plans. That's my meeting, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, uh, I'm i I'm very jealous. I my, my brother, my twin brother lives in New York. And so I was like, oh, you really have to check out this very cool fish society. So, um, so cool to, to hear that this just exists and that there can be a community of folks to talk about the coolest animals on earth in my personal opinion um so cool yeah thank you all so much uh you know for what's, us. what's always great about the club you find tricks from different people and and even when you think you know everything you always find someone else that knows something that you don't know and you, mm -hmm. you share that knowledge and you hopefully you don't raise killing machines you know <laughs> you alive you know it helps you be better you know it gets you more like answers problems resources information all that stuff I love, I love it. Thank you, Temple Poseidon Fish Room. Says Zoomed's one of the best club supporters. Yes, uh, we thank agree. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, love and would love to. Uh, would love to be there for the April meeting. That would be would be thank truly you. beautiful thank to you. witness. Thank you for helping us out. And yes. If you're ever in the area, you know you have the welcome. The welcome mat is laid out. For Always. You, you have <laughs> thank our contact you. information. I um, certainly will. Yes, that'd be great. Can Shout I out that? to Andrew. Let's not forget Andrew. Our yes, man thank you, the, Andrew. Our man oh, yeah, sorry. Well, we don't see him. He's in the background. We don't even know if there's is an Andrew. Oh, wait a minute. Let me bring him on here. Come on. <laughs> Special guest star. There he goes. Our man in the chair. And, Andrew's the shy one, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> now with that fancy hairdo, I need some of that. Come on. We just shed a love over here. This is so, why look at us, most important. Look at us, too. Like look that much look at us, too. We're bald with glasses. He has a flowing locks. So. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew contributed really heavily to the making of the talk, was really, really essential in uh, helping me put together all these slides, um, and was also my thank kind you, of Andrew personal too. mentor uh, starting at ZoomEd here. So thank you. Teamwork makes the dream work. That's what we it say. It does. It does. So we want to thank you again. Greatly appreciate it. You guys are always welcome. 
um, we can't say thanks enough because, you know, let's just say this. I'm going to mention it before we go out. We were supposed to mention the Lacey Act. I'm going to do a brief mention of the Lacey Act before I forget. For those of you that have not been involved with the Lacey Act, our Congress and, and, and representatives are making decisions that affect us as partakers in the hobby, not of just fish, but birds, wildlife, lizards, reptiles. Um, there is a great deal of information on the ZooMed website regarding the Lacey Act. Educate yourselves. You may want to reach out to your local representatives and know how the Lacey Act affects you. This okay. is something that was kind of, I don't want to say snuck in, but was kind of brought in under the radar. And we didn't really get a chance to um, take part and, and make a judgment call as far as what went into the Lacey Act. It affects what fish and animals are available to us in the public trade not only to us as users, but also public aquariums, stores. I had one of our uh, teachers even concerned because in the school, we have a zoological society, we have veterinary science. What will be available to the next generation is going to be greatly affected by how this Lacey Act uh, pans out. So I'm going to put that banner one more time with the ZooMed website on it. and. Um, you can just go zoomed.com and try to look that up and find out, educate yourselves because our future is, you know, in the hands of the next generation. And if we take it away from them, what will be left of the environment? That is my soapbox moment. <laughs> <laughs> Getting off the soapbox. <laughs> all right, Samantha, Andrew, thank you again. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you, you all so too. much. Everyone have a great evening. Thank you. All right. And don't forget, April 8th, we will be at St. Brendan's Catholic Church Parish Hall, 1202 Avenue O. All right, everybody. Check us out on Facebook if you missed anything. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.